Well, gentlemen, welcome to the Gathering of Men Luncheon. As you can tell, I'm not there. You know, in almost 17 years of doing the Gathering of Men Luncheons on Wednesday, I've never missed one. And I didn't want to miss today, but uh, I kind of been under the weather a little bit and been uh, recuperating from a mild, thank the Lord, case of COVID. And I think I'm not contagious at this point, but I didn't want to risk it. And I'll be there next week and ready to fire it up. But what I wanted to do today, and I did not want to miss, I had a backup speaker and all of that, but even the backup speaker said, John, you need to be there and give this message to the guys. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm here and I'm ready to go. Um, but um, don't miss next Wednesday. It's really a critical message that I'm gonna build on from this one and even the next series that we do. So don't miss next Wednesday. So uh, let's have a little prayer and then I'll begin. Father, help us to um, get what you want us to get today and make a change in our lives as a result of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, on uh, June 24th, I had uh, a call from Houston and found out that my dear friend for many, many, many years, Carol Vance, had died. Now, I'll tell you more about Carol Vance in a few minutes, but uh, they, uh, a few weeks later, called and said the date set for his celebration a service and graveside, and we'd like you to do the graveside service and also the message in the celebration service. So uh, I was, I mean, honored, I can't tell you how honored I was to be asked to do that. So I went down to Houston with Punky and we um, went to the graveside uh, first and I had the privilege of speaking at that. I think they had what they call a three or five gun salute. I mean, it was really powerful just for the family and a few select friends. Um, but it was an honor, an honor to be able to do that. And you'll see why in a moment, what a special person Carol Vance was. So what I want to do today, I'm just kind of going to walk through and comment on what I talked about at the celebration service when I gave the message. So I hope you'll keep the context in mind. This great man, Carol Vance, was being celebrated his life. And in the crowd were legal people from all over the state, celebrities, um, friends, uh, people from all over the country, from the corporate world. Uh, this was uh, quite a scene. And again, what an honor for me to be able to do this. Now, I also knew, I also knew. Uh, something Carol Vance would want me to add in this service, and you'll see this in a few minutes in my message. So I want to do the best I can when my throat is starting to come back, but it's a little weak. So if you'll listen real closely, I pray that you respectfully will really tune in to honor him, the Lord, and learn what he wants us to learn today. So I started out uh, when I got up for my part of the service with a prayer. So I wanna read the prayer to you. Father, I said, help us to remember death is limited. It cannot cripple love. It cannot corrode faith. It cannot eat away peace. It cannot destroy confidence. It cannot kill a friendship. It cannot shut out memories. It cannot silence courage. It cannot invade the soul. It cannot reduce eternal life. It cannot quench the spirit. It cannot lessen the power of the resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for the certain hope that we have in Jesus. Amen. And then I had a few quotes. <clears throat> I wanted to kind of lighten the mood up a little bit because sometimes some services are a little um, morbid and somber, which there needs to be an element of that out of respect. But also I knew Carol, he loved to laugh and have a good time. So here are some of the quotes. Uh, most people about dying uh, were asked, or a lot of people were asked about dying or going to heaven, and these were young kids, and some of the answers were beautiful. One was a guy named Alan, seven years old. 
Well, God doesn't tell you when you're going to die because he wants it to be a big surprise. <laughs> Aaron H. A. The hospital is the place where people go on their way to heaven. Mm -hmm. Raymond, age 10. A good doctor can help you uh, so you won't die. And a bad doctor sends you to heaven. Stephanie, age 9. Doctors help you so you won't die until you pay all their bills. Marcia, age 9. When you die, you don't have to do homework in heaven unless your teacher shows up there. Kevin, age 10. 10, he said... Uh, I'm not afraid to die because I'm a Boy Scout. And Ralph, age eight, when birds are ready to die, they just fly to heaven. So, it was engraved on a tombstone that I read about one time, and it said this, remember a man as you walk by, as you now so once was I. As I am now, so shall you be. Remember this and follow me. To what someone replied and wrote on the tombstone. To follow you, I'll not consent until I know which way you went. That was a wise man. So, in my mind, and again, I'm saying these things <clears throat> to people in the audience. I said, in my mind, there's absolutely no doubt which way Carol Vance went. No doubt at all. I said, at 4.45 a.m. on June the 24th, Carol Vance left his home at Indian Creek in Houston, Texas, and instantly was in the very presence of God. Instantly. So how do I know that? Well, you know, if we don't have confidence in God's word, the Bible, then we are without hope. But because Carol believed in the God of the Bible and in his son, and the truthfulness of every word of the Bible, here's how we know. Number, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting eternal life. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 1, 23 said the following. He said, I'm torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better with me. So he was saying there, when I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. And then there's a great passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17, <clears throat> that you might want to read on your own. So, question. When your time comes, and it will, for sure, where will you go? Where will you go? And then I looked at Carolyn, uh, Carol's wife, and I said, Carol, I know you know he's with Jesus. But I also know after 68 years of marriage, this is tough. He was your soulmate. He was your tennis partner. He was your lover. He was the father of your children. He was your best friend. It's going to be hard. And her heart was broken but she also knew down deep inside he was with Jesus. And when you know that, something happens in your life that is a dimension only God can give that all is well. All is well with my soul. So all of you in this service and in the gathering today, uh, I want you to understand these truths. What is your hope when it's all over on this planet and one day it will be over? He had an amazing family, five children, 14 grandchildren. And I said to them, you need to know with certainty that your <clears throat> granddaddy and your dad is with the Lord. There's no place else like being with Jesus. So I want to give you a few thoughts, excuse me, um, about my relationship with Carol Vance. But first, an illustration. Um, there was a young man working on his doctoral thesis at the University of Pennsylvania a number of years ago. And <coughs> this is going to be a tough one. <clears throat> and he, in his research, asked 50 people all over the age of 95, said, if you could live your life over again, how would you live it differently? These people almost unanimously said three things. And these weren't church-going people necessarily. 
They said, number one, we would reflect more. We didn't think deeply enough, too shallow in our thinking. Two, we said we would risk more. We played it too safe. Now we're 95 years old, we are a risk. Number three, and this was profound, they said we would do more things that would outlast us once we're dead and gone. So when I read that illustration, uh, back years ago when I lived in Dallas and worked with students in the Highland Park area here in Dallas, I got a pad out and I started writing down my dream. And I said, if I did anything other than what I've been doing, what would I do using my gifts, my abilities, etc., that the Lord had given me? And on, on a probably, I don't know, a, a, a pad, I wrote page after page of ideas and thoughts. And I, and I uh, took it all down to one page and reduced it to one page. Well, out of that came my dream fulfilled. And it's what I've been doing now for 45 years. Well, the way that dream was fulfilled initially is I had an invitation to go fulfill that dream in Houston, Texas. And again, that's a whole other story. Most of y'all don't even, don't even know the details. And I love to talk about that one time in one of our Wednesday lunches. There might be something you could learn to be stretched yourself and go for your dream. So now I'm in Houston. And uh, one day a friend said, you need to meet, you need to meet uh, Carol Vance. He said he's a, he's a district attorney, the DA here. He's been the DA for about 18 years. He's a rock star in Houston, um, and he's a great man. So I called his office, told the, his assistant who I was, and she set up a lunch, and we met at the Museum of Fine Arts on South Main Street, just down from Rice University, and we were sitting a little table on the outside, beautiful day, and we were just getting to know each other. So finally, <clears throat> when the meeting was about to come to an end, and by the way, he was so much fun and relaxed, big old tall six foot six lanky guy, and just at ease, and we were just having a great time. So I looked at him, and this is our first meeting, and this is, this is my new venture in going to Houston to live my dream to start working with men and fathers and leaders in Houston and around the country. So I looked at him and I said, well, Carol, before we get, let me ask you a question. Um, how you doing in that Bible? You reading that Bible? He said, John, he said, you know, Carolyn, his wife, she's on me about that all the time. She said, Carol, you got to get in the book. You got to get in the book. I said, so uh, why aren't you in the book? Well, I just haven't done it. She said, he said, I'm, I'm an elder over here at that Presbyterian church. I said, I know all about that church. And we meet uh, once a month for about three hours. And the biggest thing we discuss is argue over something about well, how we're going to, what color we're going to paint a room. He said, I deal with life and death issues every day. I want my life to count. I said, okay, Carol, I got a deal for you. It happened just like this. I said, I want you to come to my house next Tuesday at seven in the morning. I'll cook you a Jimmy on hot sausage, scrambled eggs. Uh, I'll have a, some orange juice for you and toast and coffee, and we're going to get after it. He looked at me and he said, I'll be there. So every Tuesday for the next year, Carol Vance, Mr. DA, showed up at my little house for our breakfast and time together. Well, little did I know, little did I know what God was going to do. So let me just give you a little rundown here what happened, just a few things. Uh, so um, in that time together, I said, Carol, why don't we go down um, to your office and pick out two or three of your key people and let's start a little study down there. He said, let's do it. So he actually picked a couple of guys, one of which after he left became the DA. Um, then I said, how many people you got um, in the office here? He said, about 200 in the building. I said, what are you doing to try to impact them? He said, you have an idea? I said, yeah, I got an idea. I said, why don't you put a lunch on? We'll do it maybe three or four in a row and you can uh, serve a, a sandwich and a cookie and a bag of chips and some water and a cookie, whatever. 
and make it for a buck and underwrite the rest and I'll speak and have a Q and A. He said, let's do it. So we started impacting the whole DA office and building. Then uh, one day he said to me, uh, and again, I'm just giving you a few highlights. Said, he said, Sean, he said, I, got, I won't be able to meet next week. He said, I've got to go to this meeting in Washington. I said, what is it? He said, well, he was a very humble guy. I'm, I'm the president of the National DA Association all over the United States, and I got to be there. And I said, so what are you going to do to impact the DAs from all over the country? He said, you have an idea? I sure do. Why don't you put a breakfast on, let your office here, set it up, communicate to all the DAs, get the room at, at the Hilton in, uh, in, in Washington, the Washington Hilton. And I said, um, I'll get somebody to speak for you and they'll be great. And so I got Mark Hatfield, who was 30 year uh, serving as a U.S. Senator from Oregon, a great man of God and loved Jesus. He said, okay, let's do it. So when he got back, I said, Carol, how'd it go? He said, John, the place was packed out. Every DA was there and Mark, Mark Hatfield crushed it. He unreservedly shared his love for Jesus. It was fantastic. So I said, okay, there we go. Now, I don't know, maybe a year later he calls and we're still meeting. He said, John, I don't think I'm gonna run again for DA. I've done it for 22 years and I think my time's up. So I said, what are you gonna do? He said, well, I've had an offer from a great firm here in Houston, Braceful Patterson uh, Law Firm. I think at that time it might've been the second largest firm in the city. And he said, they're gonna make me a partner. And I know a lot of the guys there, and I did too, they came to a class that I taught at that Presbyterian church. So um, Bill Wild, Carton Wild, and uh, all those guys were great. So Cersei Bracewell, I think, was another one that was one of the key guys there. So anyway, um, about a, three or four months later after he had moved to the law firm, he called and said, uh, Bill Wild and I want to have lunch with you. And so in that lunch, he said, would you lead a study for our partners? And so we've got about 21, 22 partners, probably about 12 or 13 of them will come. I said, let's do it. So for years, we met at, on the 27th floor of the Pennzoil building uh, in downtown Houston with about 13, 12 to 13 of the partners. And what an honor it was to be with these guys. Some of these guys were really seeking uh, uh, in their faith and their life and came to know Christ. But again, that's, that's a whole other story. But how the Lord used that was powerful. Well, then um, I, I got the opportunity to go to Orlando. And I remember going over it with Carol, the opportunity. He was praying about it and giving me some good counsel along with some other people. And so we made the move in 1983 from Houston, Texas to Orlando, where I was for 21 years. Um, got a call one day from Carol. I don't know, six months later, whatever it was. He said, Johnny said, Ann Richards, the governor, has asked me if I'll be the chairman of the board of the uh, prison systems, uh, Texas prison system. And I said, no, I can't be the chairman, but, but I, I could be on your board. There, there was a slot empty and they needed somebody. So he said, do you think I should do it? And I said, well, Carol, I said, uh, my, you need to ask God about that. But my thought is you're already on so many boards and doing stuff all over the city as well as your job as a partner at the firm. I said, um, I, I'd, I'd question whether you need to do that or not. But before you make up your mind, I want you to meet somebody. So I lined him up with a guy named Chuck Colson of Watergate fame. And uh, he had come to know Christ in prison. When he got out, he started a, a prison ministry, probably one of the greatest ever on the planet called Prison Fellowship. So I got the two of them together and uh, Chuck asked uh, Carol to go with him on a trip to Brazil to a, a unit down there that had a Christian part to it, an area in it where they train people in the Bible Christian uh, principles, etc. So Carol came back from that. He said, I got to do that in Houston. So he goes to George Bush, governor then, and said, George, this is what I saw down there. 
we got to do this. This is what it can do to make a difference in our system. George said, I'll help you do anything you need to do to get it done. And they did it. And a number of years ago, if you go down to Sugarland, Texas, at the Jester unit, within that unit, there's the thing called the Carol S. Vance unit, with over, where over 200 men can come at any given time if you qualify to get in there. And the, the whole thing is Christian based, biblically based. Carol wrote a book, and it's called After the Leap. And this book, uh, I just lost my glasses, and I'm going to have to go down for them. And you're going to have to be forgiving of my awkwardness here. I got excited. But he wrote this book called After the Leap. And these are basic studies in how to help a person have build a foundation in their life and faith. Carol, until he died, was going down there even at almost 89 years old twice a week making the drive to Sugarland and teaching the prisoners, along with a whole bunch of other people that talk there, chaplains and guest speakers, etc. So um, it's a pretty amazing resume, isn't it? Well, I'm just giving you a few highlights. I could give you, I could go on the rest of the day, but there's a powerful lesson that comes out of this. More time and Carol learned this, with fewer people equals a greater impact on for Christ. More time with fewer people will make a greater impact for Christ. You give me a handful of men that are deeply committed to Jesus Christ and following him and reporting for duty, those few men can turn a city and a country upside down. Think about the queen. Over 4 billion people, I've been told, watched the ceremonies the last few days in England. One person. So, uh, I, I looked at Carol at that Carolyn at the time, and I said, Carol, I said, you need to know something. You don't need this lesson. I said, uh, you've already been living this lesson out in your life for years of investing in the hearts and lives of people. And... I, I thank God for you for doing that. So um, let's move on here a little bit. One of the things I love about Carol, and he was something else, I said he loved, he loved Mexican food. And he always went to Molina's and had the Williams special. And I, every time I was there, he said, we're going to Molina's. We'd come home, we'd be watching a ball game or something, and they're just talking. He'd get up and disappear and come back about two or three minutes later with two big old bowls of uh, uh, Bluebell ice cream. I mean, he loved that ice cream and so do I. He was a big tennis player. He didn't start playing until he was 45 years old. He told me he took five lessons and for three years he was in the top 10 in Texas for that period of time in tennis with men all over the state. He was quite an athlete, loved sports, learned to play golf. I mean, just, he was just a great guy. So why was Carol the kind of man he was. Why was he the kind of man he was? Well, in 2 Samuel 13, let me give you a little history here. Joab had murdered Abner. You can read about it. King David was grieved, obviously, deeply. But then the king, King David, speaks. And the king said to his servants, Do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? Carol Vance was not only a son, he was not only a great man, but he was a prince. There aren't many men that you can call a prince. A prince is a humble man, one who is highly respected, and a man of great character. So where does all that come from? It comes from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ supernaturally invades a person's life and reproduces himself in you so that you can become like his son, Jesus. It's a supernatural life. As I often say, the Christian life is not easy. It's difficult, but he reproduces himself in us. There's nothing like it. So as I kind of wound things up and I, everything I'm telling you, I said to this audience, like I'm saying to you today, 
So I kind of want to close out with, for the next few minutes, a few life-changing lessons. And I looked at Carolyn at, at this point, his wife, and I said, you taught him all these. You taught every one of them to him and to the rest of the family. So I said, first of all, to the family, don't forget how much he loved you. Your daddy loved you. Your granddaddy loved you. Uh, I can't tell you how much he thought of and loved each one of you. He gave you the gift of himself. He gave you the gift of his time. He did all this because he cared, because of Jesus living in his life. Then I gave him a thought. I said, you will only be able to love others to the degree you love yourself. And you'll only love yourself to the degree you know how much God loves you. So if you want to be a great lover of your children, of your grandchildren, and respect people, then you have to know how much God loves you. And once you know how much he loves you, then you can love yourself. Carol knew how much the Lord thought of him. And it made all the difference in the world. So finally, uh, Carol told me to tell you not to forget um, the main thing. So I said, okay, Carol. I'll tell them. And this is what I told the audience that was there. I said, a lot of times people say, well, we'll see him when we get there. Not necessarily. Because a lot of people at funerals or hearing messages or whatever, say, well, we see him when we get there. If you want to see him when you get, when you get there, you got to get there. And the only way you can get there is you have Jesus in your life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. So the only way you make it, he has to live in you. And then I shared the gospel and the, the good news of Christ in a very brief fashion. And I said, you got to remember, number one from the Bible, if you go back to the first of the Bible, Genesis 3, God looked down. And the Bible said, he says that God was, was so disappointed in the direction of the decisions of humankind. He could have turned his back on humanity and said, I've had it with you, but he didn't. Down number two, he put skin on and came down on this planet in the form of a person named Jesus. And Jesus, who claimed to be the son of God, got in a body. He came that way so human beings could understand him and understand what God was like. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father because we're the same. What a brilliant plan. But he didn't come just, just to heal people and to help people and encourage people. Third down, Jesus laid down his life on a cross. But do, do you know why? Because we've all offended God. And that has ended up in what we call sin. And sin is a spiritual cancer. And it carries with it, the Bible says, a penalty. And the penalty has to be removed. It's what separates us from a holy God. A holy God and an unholy man or woman do not go together. He dies on the cross and he said, I will take your penalty on myself and die the death you should die on this cross. But then it gets better than that. The fourth down. Jesus tells us in Philippians through the apostle Paul, every knee must bow down. There comes a point, I said to all the people there and to us on this video today, every one of us have to become uh, a person that's willing to be humble and cry uncle and say, Lord, in and of myself, I'll never qualify and be good enough to be with you. I need a savior. And it comes at that point where you simply say, Jesus, come into my life, clean me up. And from this day forward, Help me to become the person you want me to be. And I literally at that point had everybody bow their heads. And I gave that invitation to come to Christ. You say that at a funeral, what better time? And people came to Christ. And I know Carol Vance was jumping up and down and screaming and clapping and praising God and everything else. That's it. I know some of you people, even today, like I said then, you say, I don't believe that Jesus stuff. You will. You will someday. I just hope it's not too late. So what more does the Lord need to do? He sent Jesus. Cry uncle. 
So a final word uh, from Carol. This is from Carol to the family and to you today. I'm okay. I'm better than okay. I'm with Jesus. I miss each one of you terribly. But remember, please remember, I'm with Jesus. I want to tell you something about Carol. I talked to Carol Vance on the telephone more times over the years. And an interesting thing I always remember at the end, I'd say, Carol, see you later. Bye. He would never say goodbye. He would just hang up. When I saw him on March the 26th, a couple months before he died, I went to his house. I was in Houston speaking for a visit. He was struggling with his memory at that point, but he did okay. When we were finished visiting, he walked me out to my car. He said, you know, uh, we need to get with you and Punky and have a good dinner one night soon. And we hugged, but he never said goodbye. I'll ask him about that someday. I love you, Carol. So, gentlemen, I want you to know I love you, too. I don't know a lot of you. I know some of you. But I care for all of you. And more than anything else, I want you to know that Jesus, that Carol Vance knew, and is with today. And I pray you'll ask him into your life. I can't make you do it. The offer's there. Just ask him and he'll come in. And you'll start all over again. Well, it's been good to be together today. I wish I could have been there. Thank you so much for coming, and I'll see you next week.